So as a way of a prologue, does anyone here know who this is? Okay, John, who is it? Uh, if I'm seeing it right, he's the, uh, the gentleman who passed away in the health sciences uh, emergency room in Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. After he had, they, when they found him, he was already in rigor mortis. That's uh, right. He's Aboriginal. That's right. So I'm, uh, th that's uh, absolutely correct. He's Mr. Uh, Brian Sinclair. 45 years old, a W amputee, Aboriginal, and he was found dead in the emergency room of the uh, Winnipeg Hospital in 2008 after waiting for 34 hours without seeing, um, being seen by medical personnel. Mr. Mr. Sinclair was slumped, slumped over in his wheelchair during that period. He vomited a number of times. Um, a security guard and others um, brought him a, a pail to, to vomit in. And eventually he failed to stir. Several non-medical personnel were uh, approached the desk uh, and said, you know, this man seems to be sitting there for a long time and he's kind of, you know, still. And uh, one of the security guards later uh, said, you know, I just presumed that he was, quote, sleeping at off, unquote. But of course, Mr. Sinclair was not sleeping it off. He was, in fact, dying, and in fact died, as John noted, uh, from a very treatable bladder infection. The inquest to his death is uh, ongoing, and um, just recently, however, his family and a number of the Aboriginal organizations that were supporting um, the family in the inquest have withdrawn in the process because they said the focus of the inquest has now f uh, become overcrowding in emergency centers and that they are not really addressing some of the social issues that underpin the unwarranted demise of Mr. Sinclair. And I bring this up today because the title of my presentation focuses on migrant bodies, and this is, after all, uh, an, a migrant and ethnic relations um, center. But uh, what I'm speaking about today really um, is in reference to all forms of racialized bodies. And uh, certainly it is as relevant to aboriginality uh, in our healthcare systems as uh, certainly was evident in Mr. Sinclair's case. He was again both seen and not seen as are many um, racialized uh, migrants and others in our, in our society and particularly in the healthcare encounters that I'm talking about today. So I thought I would introduce his seeing and not seeing as a, 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 a a, a prologue for you. Now, my presentation features um, some of the my recent musings, I should say, and some of my earlier work, refracted perhaps through a slightly different lens, and it represents a bit of a work in progress, so I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, at the heart of it are some discussion of some quotidian experiences of racialized individuals, particularly those who are marked as immigrants and uh, their relationship with the Canadian healthcare system. And um, I'm interested in by way that also by the way that sight and what we see and what we don't see is really embedded in these institutions and these encounters. So I'll begin with a bit of a brief overview of immigrant health and kind of immigrants in Canada. I'm sure it'll be very familiar for many of you. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the um, biomedicine and the evolution of biomedicine. Again, maybe a, a bit familiar to another group of you or, or a, a subset of you. Um, I'll also talk about visuality and the primacy of visuality to biomedicine and the link between the visual and dimensions of time in the organization of uh, healthcare encounters. I'll talk a bit about the organization of healthcare and body matters, sort of the social body and how we read bodies. And finally, conclude with some musings about uh, materializing bodies and embodied uh, encounters. So I'm going to beg your indulgence somewhat because my talk today will kind of shuttle between warp and weft to weave what I hope will be some somewhat coherent um, uh, product at the end, and if not, at least uh, coherent, and at least I hope colorful. So I will uh, warn, warn you, therefore, that when I'm sometimes moving in different directions, to ask you to park your thoughts here and then move on to another topic, and hopefully we will weave them all together at the end. Okay, but first, a word about words. Uh, 
as you'll see in the slides, that I use a particular orthography when I talk about immigrants. So I am with a slash and migrants. And I use this particularly because I want to constantly remind us that there is a huge amount of blurring of categories between what we often see as these categories of immigrant as voluntary migrants, migrants as temporary workers, and refugees as uh, who are depicted as involuntary settlers. Um, the they are is a great deal of slippage between these categories, great deal of questions and, and contestation about how voluntary is somebody who's a voluntary migrant. Um, but I would also emphasize that um, the category under which somebody comes to Canada really determines not only his or her ability to become a permanent resident, but also structures access to things like auxiliary health services, education, settlement services that are meant to, of course, assist with uh, integration into Canadian society. So the assignation of one of these labels is, um, has, is, is important for individuals and for families and communities in terms of access to rights programs and services. But again, there's a lot of slippage between um, these categories and I want to just constantly remind us that, that that is occurring. So do not think about immigrant or migrant as, you know, as really fixed categories or, and the same with refugee because when we think about refugees we often, th there's this image that they're the great unwashed when in fact, you know, when something, political turmoil happens, it can be people who are extremely well educated as well as people who are, you know, the peasants who are fleeing those conditions and, and yet people are treated as though they are somehow one homogenous uh, a, a group under each of these categories. So uh, a, a word about that. The other term that I will often use is racialization or racial, racialized. I use this because um, the, it, what it refers to, I think, is the, the, the process, the political, ideological of othering individuals by relegating them to immutable uh, or presumably immutable racial categories. And these racialized racial categories um, are presumed to have some kind of biological um, you know, validation, uh, though I've never seen anybody dis um, decide that they're going to actually um, identify somebody's race by actually genetically testing them. So in fact, when we talk about race as a, cate as a biological category, um, it's based on this presumption that there are some phenotypic characteristics uh, and, and predetermined set of morphological characteristics that uh, you, know, you can differentiate uh, individual human beings by and groups of individuals by. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, for those of you who are interested, there is a, some really interesting work done on kind of the history of the development of racialized categories. They've always been political, they've always been associated with, with um, notions about intelligence and people's abilities and who they are, and they've always been hierarchically ranked. So um, I think that we can talk about race as a social construct, as a social category, and one that can be very powerful for people, but um, when we talk about racialization, we're talking about kind of applying these labels as though they have some kind of rigid biological meanings for people rather than a social political meaning. And um, the, uh, the process of, of um, uh, I think, of if I failed to, to trouble these racial categories, I think it would be continuing to reify the notion of race as a somehow having some kind of scientific biological validity. So I choose constantly to, to again, um, contest that notion. I also use the term biomedicine. And biomedicine refers to the uh, relatively young Western scientific form of healing that um, you get generally here in Canada. Um, and due to its current hegemonic status, there's this notion that it's medicine, right? And it's the only form of medicine. And so it takes on this, uh, the mantle of being the, um, even though it might be a, a, a very dominant form of, of of healing, it is not certainly the only one, and it's certainly not a, 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 the longest standing one. When we look at things like Ayurvedic medicine in South Asia, or Chinese medicine, or many other forms of medicine that are empirical, that have a very, very long tradition of treatments, um, those two are, are very important healing traditions. And so I use the term biomedicine to try to um, 
kind of uh, disrupt the notion that it that uh, medicine is that Western medicine is the kind of only form of medicine, the dominant form, and uh, it's uh, not sort of can't be equated with other forms of healing. So uh, I will talk about the rise of biomedicine. We do that. Okay. Returning now to the narrative, does anyone know who China Doll is? China Doll is, if you go to Ottawa, China Doll is uh, a, um, the, the most well-known uh, drag queen in Chinatown. So there you go. You can have karaoke with China Doll. Um, so great, uh, I, I can't, con uh, and he, uh, she works at her parents' uh, Chinese restaurant. I have no idea what the food is like, but um, it, you can see that uh, China Doll has become so popular that they actually have a mural outside to advertise not their food, but China Doll. Um, so, uh, returning now to the main narrative, uh, and without the, P the public service announcement for um, uh, your next visit to um, Ottawa, uh, while migration has been ongoing for centuries, the intensity, the density, the breadth of contemporary global mi migration, I think we can agree, is quite unique. There are 220 million people around the world, half of whom are women, who can now be kind of constituted as part of this global migration. Of course, Canada is um, a uh, you know destination country. In 2012, uh, we brought in 226,000 immigrants and uh, about over 23,000 refugees. At present, Canada's populace is about a little over 18% are foreign born. We're the second most culturally diverse country in the world, Australia being number one. And uh, the statistics suggest that um, it, it will we'll probably have 25 to 28% of the population foreign born by 2031. I don't know why they don't make it 2030, but 2031, definitely. Okay. Um, at present, about 48% of uh, immigrants are coming from Asia Pacific, 22.6% um, from Africa and Middle East, 15% from Europe, 10% from South and Central America, and 4% from the United States. Uh, Foreign-born Canadians are extremely well educated. The prevalence of higher education is 51% versus 20% for native-born Canadians. And um, foreign-born Canadians account for 40% of all Canadians with master's degrees and 49% of those with doctorates. Um, so I think there's some of us around the room here, <laughs> if I can recall. <laughs> Furthermore, um, Immigrant women are uh, twice as, as likely, and men are three times as likely, more than uh, their native-born counterparts, to have university degrees. Um, despite, however, the fact that um, foreign-born Canadians tend to be better educated than the native-born populace, newcomers, if I can call them that, us that, them that, um, face disproportionately high rates of un and underemployment. And in fact, evidence suggests that unemployment rate of immigrants increases with their level of education. So um, that's a, an interesting thought as to why. Now, um, foreign-born uh, migrant women uh, experience the greatest amount of discrepancy between their educational status and their employment status. So we talk about ed employment education mis mismatch, that being you know, the, the kind of education you need in order to fill the job and the education that one possesses. Uh, foreign born women have the most dramatic uh, disparity there. Um, and what's uh, important is that the probability of this employment mismatch does not appear to decrease over time spent in Canada for, for women. Moreover, 65% of immigrants fall into low income in the first decade of coming to Canada, and that's regardless of immigration. Uh, in fact, the financial return on foreign experience and, um, and sort of foreign work experience has declined to zero in the last decade. So we see that there's, as you know, there's a huge amount of, uh, of problems with uh, 
you know, accreditation, uh, acceptance of foreign, of foreign work experience, foreign credentials, etc. And it's gotten to the point where it's, it's come to mean nothing, no matter how well uh, you know, ex how much experience people have had, how much education people have had, or even where they've had it. It's, uh, it's pretty dramatic. Uh, we know, of course, that uh, non-Europeans, um, so racialized mig uh, migrants in general, in, uh, have an increased experience of economic exclusion, and that's even through the second generation. So I think that as Canadians um, today, whether we are born here or not born here, we have to come to grips with the fact that um, you know, we, we can't say anymore that it has to do with foreign education or foreign work experience. We have to deal with what's happening here in terms of just out and out racism um, and why people are being excluded. Secondly, um, racialized and foreign born uh, status increases the likelihood that somebody will be living in poverty. Okay, well that's really cheery. Don't worry, I'll get you more depressed later. <laughs> why start now? Okay, so let's talk about briefly about health and health care. Um, like many immigrant receiving countries, migrants to Canada are in better health than the native born populace. So this is a trend um, known as the healthy immigrant effect. So people who, who migrate tend to be in better health and um, we know that that health benefit seems to, um, you know, seems to last. Um, perhaps over a long period of time, but it is, does not accrue to everyone. So there is tends to be short-lived amongst certain groups of people. And so when we actually look and disaggregate the data, we find that um, non-Europeans, uh, the health of non-Europeans declines twice as fast as that of Europeans, and especially women. So for the longest time, people would say, Oh, people come here, foreign um, people are healthier, and that's all great and wonderful, and they'll just stay that way. Their health might decline almost to the level of that of native born Canadians over time, but that's good. But then when, when people started to ask, well, let's maybe start to disaggregate that population based data a little bit, we find in FICE is much more complicated than that. So there are certain groups that are declining more rapidly than others and, and in fact it tends to be racialized women whose, whose health declines more rapidly. Okay, So the question is of course why? Anyone have a guess? No one? <laughs> Language barriers. Lack of healthcare, language barriers. What else? Yeah. Diet. Diet. You were gonna say. Uh, well, stress. Stress. Okay. <coughs> right. Well, what's interesting is, of course, we often think about the things that come to mind: health behaviors, diet, that kind of thing. What's really interesting is that um, when I lived in rural Alberta. Um, I could get chapati flour, I could get all kinds of like, um, you know, Indian, South Asian herbs, I could get all kinds of things um, in a rural grocery store that probably I would not have thought I'd be able to get. And I'm not just talking, you know, it's just because I have to like South Asian food that that's what I'd be looking for, but you could get all kinds of, of, of diff diversity of foodstuffs. And when I actually started to ask people to, for instance, keep diet um, uh, logs of what they ate, found for the most part that many people were eating a very similar diet to what they had. Not everybody. But if people were starting to eat McDonald's back home, they were still eating McDonald's in Canada. Some people, of course, change their diets, or the food that they had might be somewhat different. So some, some people would talk about, for instance, they, um, they, the fruit juices they had back home were natural, and then they come to Canada, and the things that they're drinking they think are natural are, in fact, not natural, or getting more sugars, etc. But it seems to me that, that diet, it, it, there was always this presumption that people's diets changed dramatically. And the, bot it, the bottom line is it might be for some people, but and probably not for everybody. And so what other health behaviors we think about as contributing to ill health? Things like smoking, lack of exercise. But when we look 
we find that, for instance, newcomers smoke less, way less than Canadians, uh, than native-born Canadians. Um, and when we look at things like physical inactivity, um, the, there was an interesting that the there was a, a, a small sort of decrease in physical activity, or should I say increase in obesity, but the people who, who they found that in were mostly the European males, so precisely the group that were not experiencing the most dramatic deterioration of their health status. So, what else is going on? And I think um, you hit the nail on the head when you said stress. So issues around structural issues, um, social issues, these seem to have the most important um, impact, and not to say those others don't, because they obviously can, but from a, a, a population-based perspective, uh, it seems that things like um, having uh, uh, access to, um, to social support, um, having uh, language skills, um, uh, linguistic, you know, good, decent linguistic skills to get access to things, but also to feel a part of uh, Canadian society, um, were really uh, much more important than some of the uh, things around sort of health behaviors. So basically, the social determinants of health were much more important. Things like decline um, in, in uh, socioeconomic status, uh, which we know has an impact on health and well being. And I think we can also suggest that there's a relationship between racialized status and health because, again, racialized status does not produce a necessarily homogeneous kind of uh, health outcomes, but we know that racism can have an impact on people physiologically via stress response, but also it's associated with, as I've mentioned, with poverty, but also with trouble, um, you know, accessing health services, with, uh, and then with poverty you have, uh, you know, difficulty accessing uh, self-care um, or auxiliary services and things like that. So all of those things have a a very important impact on health and well-being. Okay, we're going to park that for now and I will focus now on biomedicine and again on the primacy of the visual from the early days of biomedicine to contemporary period. So again, this is really a fast overview of just a few things. Um, so it might be a review for some of you or maybe new, so we will see. Now, um, through the 18th century in Europe, the body was really seen as something that was opaque. The body was the, uh, not the, the inner uh, functioning of the body it was seen as kind of a miasma, kind of ooze that moved back and forth. And uh, you couldn't see inside of it, so the way that you would determine disease would be through lancing and bleeding. That's when you would have, you, if people experienced pain, they had this, kind, it was called an inner flux, and you would have to bleed off to uh, the, the person, you'd lance the person, bloodlet, and, and see what was coming out inside. And they would then determine, they would see something in the blood or whatever uh, was coming out, and try to determine what was uh, going going wrong inside the body. Um, and so there was this sense that it was a part, it was kind of a, a mystery, right? Um, but it was also part of, of, uh, of nature. So it was like nature was contained in the body and nature is, you know, and the body is situated within nature. And of course, much of this has changed and again, uh, we owe much of our uh, of this, of course, to Michel Foucault's um, under, understanding of and his <coughs> explanations of the emergence of biomedicine uh, in revolutionary France, but uh, and where he talks about how um, biomedicine and the disciplinary power um, that it, uh, you know, that was con came along with it suggests that the mysteries of the body, uh, again, was converted into a mechanistic body. So this mysterious body becomes this mechanistic body. It's open to scrutiny through the spectacle of, of public executions, which was laid out the inning, you know, inner part pieces of the body in quite macabre details, but it, and it was seen as a body that was comprised of discrete parts, um, and it was, uh, you know, through the 
the, um, uh, over time, the body was coalesced into a body of, of, uh, of knowledge. So the observations of the body were coalesced into the body of knowledge. And the first attempt to order scientific discovery based on this body of knowledge was based through these, what he calls the medical gaze. And um, so, and these took place at the uh, bedside or the body side, shall we say, of patients, most of whom were indigent, who regarded less as people and more as kind of reproducible pathological facts. So all patients were meant to suffer in the same way, all diseases were meant to uh, operate in the same way. And so the idea was that the, you would observe the uh, symptoms and signs and that these became much more important than the individuals themselves. So the idea was that the, through the gaze you could read the disease like a text through the body of the patient. And what's interesting is that this emphasis on observation and a particular kind of observation of reading through the body to this, <coughs> this patho pathology um, meant that vision, a particular kind of vision, became the dominant sense in biomedicine. What's interesting about vision, of course, is that um, you know, it can be uh, you know, a warm and embracing thing, but it can also be about sort of a sense of separation. And um, again, you saw people working with people who were indigent and they didn't want to touch them, so you have this this increased distanciation between the physician and the patient. Uh, you have things like the stethoscope which gets developed in the 19th century which further ensures that nobody has to like, stick their ear right against the body of somebody who's poor but you don't even have to touch them. right? And so this kind of helped to kind of solidify distance between patient and the object of, uh, uh, sorry, the, the physician and the patient as the object of observation. So. We see this, of course, moving f ahead, a couple hundred years or so. Uh, we see, of course, how um, biomedicine has evolved to, um, to include a, a great many technologies of visualization. And many of you may have uh, experienced uh, this form of the medical gaze through the auspices of many of the myriad visualizing techniques that are currently in use. And I was sharing um, an anecdote with some folks over lunch today about how uh, one of my experiences uh, a number of years ago when I was uh, going into hospital to have some tests done and um, I was, you know, stuck in one of those awful hospital gowns, you know, that somebody my size can barely fit into. And I was stuck on one of those, you know, gurneys and this, uh, the physician came in and my back was turned to him because of the way they were positioning me for the test. I wanted to ask him a question. And um, the, when I started to talk to him, at first he didn't respond to me at all. And I asked him a question again, didn't respond to me at all. And finally I looked and I realized when he started to talk to me, he was talking to this radiological image in the monitor, not to me, right? Because that's what he was addressing, is this kind of, this pathology over there, or potential pathology over there. And of course, I wanted to jump up and start writing, right? And I'm like, oh, sit there, you're not there, right? So I found myself, again, kind of reduced to this image. And you realize, of course, that each of these images is added to an inventory of images. And that this multiplying of what is seen builds up this sense of solidity, like a lot of kind of geologic accretions. And so what is not seen starts to fade, right? What's not seen is moved further in the background. We got further, you know, detail. So and inevitably, you're lost, right? The, the, any kind of detail, any kind of context, all of that is lost. And um, there's this, I think, again, with the, the broader the vision, is narrowed, uh, or the broader vision is narrowed, and as technologies further mediate, there's greater disjuncture between representation and the thing, and all of that kind of widens. So we also see with 
the rise of biomedicine, it's integrated with the rise of state power, with um, exerting control over individuals in the population and forms of surveillance from, you know, counting individuals conf um, uh, to control of individuals and confinement and all of those rose along with political and health authorities which reinforced each other during times of epidemic, during social unrest and aided of course in colonial expansion and the maintenance of social, gender, racial, cultural hierarchies. And so we saw again uh, the rise of these totalizing institutions where people could be confined and observed, where dossiers were collected, like our medical files, our student files, all those things that they say will follow you the rest of your life, right? Um, and while all these, our healthcare encounters are, and institutions continue with the practice of surveillance, the technologies have continued to organize the logic of the workplace and also are engaged in the disciplining of workers as well as patients when we think about the hospital. So I want to talk now a little bit about that, about the ways in which healthcare has been reorganized and what it, what it has meant in terms of the way in which we interact. Okay, so I want to um, turn our attention to um, what has been called healthcare reform or health reform in the past few decades. And um, I'm going to focus uh, in this part on some work I did many years ago or a number of years ago with nurses and racialized patients, uh, women who were uh, uh, giving birth in hospitals. So I will uh, refer to that to some degree. Now healthcare reform in Canada has been driven as it has in other parts of the world by a neoliberal agenda that has focused on fiscal restraint, the pressures of the global economy, changing technology and shifting demographic profile. Uh, economic downturns in the 80s and 90s and a renewed interest on focus on debt reduction resulted in reduced federal transfers payments to provinces that were destined to the healthcare sector. So provinces responded by engaging in um, a new uh, waves of healthcare restructuring and so there were all these total quality and total quality management and total quality improvement you know ad infinitum kinds of reforms that resulted in uh, often altering uh, decision-making structures, decentralizing some, centralizing others, and then decentralizing them again and all kinds of things. But it also uh, signaled a, a dramatic shift from institutional to community care and home care, the closure of a lot of facilities, um, massive layoffs, predominantly of female staff, and the reduction um, became concomitant with changes in patient care um, and also at a time when um, there was a changing demographic profile of patients as was obvious from my description of um, immigration to Canada. In labor and delivery, which is the um, group that I was uh, working with, for instance, discharge from hospital um, became mandatory in 24 hours. And it used to be that women would stay for labor and delivery for at least three days, if not five days or longer. And uh, now it's 24 hours, and um, this was then complemented uh, by a, a visit uh, uh, by a healthcare nurse um, for all new mothers at home. And what was interesting is that um, when I first started doing this work, the, the health authority I worked with had just done a, a very uh, detailed survey of how happy people were with this shift and with the, you know, leaving hospital in 24 hours and the home care delivery, etc. And what they found was that, oh gee, that was interesting. There were a third of the women who were dissatisfied with this. And they said, see, we have two thirds of the people who are really happy with it. Just so happens that that one third of people who were not happy with it happened to be immigrant women. Right? And for a variety of reasons, um, they might not have been satisfied with the programs, but that was uh, what was happening. And of course, they, just the fact that two thirds had decided it was a good idea was fine. Um, but uh, of course, there were some people in the healthcare system who were still you know, interested in why this wasn't working and what, what needed to happen. One of the things, as I mentioned before, um, is that there was this also push for uh, increased 
uh, self-care in that many uh, of the times people who would uh, when they would leave hospital they'd get some you know free supplies and things like that and those were no longer available so suddenly people are having to buy these things themselves or they'd be told you know yes this is fine but you know make sure you pick this up when you go home and it's this presumption that you know you'll be able to do it and again given the intersections between racialized status and poverty this of course had a, an, a, a much more uh, you know a, a greater impact and a disproportionate impact on um, immigrants and, and migrant persons and Aboriginal persons so at the same time the there was this movement to uh, in different kinds of technologies of surveillance on the workers themselves. So the under healthcare reform, the kind of values of care and compassion that had grounded nursing education and practice for centuries, um, found that they were, uh, you know, kind of in some ways tempered. And uh, some people would say they were uh, under uh, uh, undermined by institutional regulations that were meant to, again, create this kind of new efficient operation, this kind of nursing practice became disciplined, I say, through this new economy of care. Things that involved bureaucratic schedules, forms that needed to account for um, patients and every movement um, that uh, one did with a patient. So people had to fill out time charts, you know, what, how much time did I do this with someone? How much time did I do that with someone? And so self, their surveillance became both self-administered and also subject to the scrutiny of managers in patient care and administration. So with the you know this notion that time is money uh, it was really uh, th there was any kind of latitude of patient care was really discouraged and so it also meant that spending time efficiently necessitated accommodating more patients under nurses care um, and so uh, it was uh, it also meant to a lot of time compression so there was increased workload uh, increased patient uh, patient care, uh, and there was increased workload in part because they had done things like changed where supplies were kept and how many supplies are kept on hand. So if you were running out of diapers and labor and delivery, they might not be the, in the store. There might not be an adequate number in the storage unit, so you'd have to go and call somebody else to get them to come and bring them, etc. So all of these things are adding to the workload at the same time. Um, and uh, there was, uh, again, increased paperwork. And of course, not surprising, an increase in patient complaints, shorter supplies, fewer staff. So they're working, really working to um, contract the amount of time, or all of this um, effectively contracted the amount of time available for intimate patient interaction. Um, what was, was uh, you know, often a, a felt as a loss for the nurses that I, that I would uh, interviewed because they said caring labor was, and being caring was part of why they went into nursing to begin with. And that was, you know, often interaction with the patients was the most rewarding part of their work. Um, and so they felt that the most meaningful part of their, their jobs were being kind of, uh, you know, eroded. Uh, as Rachel said, there's nowhere, you know, and this, uh, this is a, a pseudonym, of course, uh, but one of the nurses I spoke to said, there's nowhere, you know, nowhere when they do this classification thing, there's nowhere that says, the man is dying, needs to hold your hand. You know, there's no spot for that. And yet really, that is important as the rest of the stuff that you can do. But you don't get to do it. You don't. And after a while, you condition yourself to not even think about those things, or you can't continue to work. So these are the kinds of responses that many of the nurses we spoke to had about uh, working uh, under these kinds of conditions. Now, now I'm going to uh, shift you back again, moving from the healthcare uh, system and healthcare to uh, what is the uh, kind of preparation for talking about the interaction between patients and healthcare professionals. And so again, we are all um, cognizant of the fact that when we first meet someone or glimpse someone, 
we read their bodies, we read the social body, and so we, t we read people's social status and their markers of social status um, almost at, a, a, at an unconscious level. And um, so, you know, let's talk about the ways in which we learn to read or, or how, how we identify uh, people, who is us, who is other. Uh, we read the bodies around us uh, from things like adornment and shape, patterns of movement. We make assessments about the people we meet, the people around us. And for some people, not everybody, because some of us are, you know, all cool postmodern types that are just all fluid and everything, but for many people it's difficult to um, not be able to slot people into something or another. You know, so, um, and it becomes this kind of, well, for others, you know, this kind of messiness of human expression and experience is something that, you know, we kind of revel in. Um, but again, none of the kind of markers of social that the social body are themselves, um, you know, solid. They're all mutable. They're all intersecting and and uh, you know interactive. So gender, for instance, um, we all know has is a is a category that people uh, will often try to slot people into almost straight away. I always love to tell the story. I'm an anthropologist, as, as uh, Dr. Dodson mentioned, by, by training, and I always love the story of um, a Zuni uh, two spirited person uh, called Wei Wa. Has anyone heard of Wei Wa? Mm -hmm. No? Yes? Did I hear a yes there? No. Um, Wei Wa was, um, uh, became, uh, was befriended by the wife of an Indian commissioner in the U.S in the 1800s, 1880s. And um, this woman brought Weiwa to uh, Washington, D.C. And, and said she was an Indian princess. That's how she was presented. And she was feted all around the city. Um, everybody wanted to you know, get to know her and everything. And she had, was a remarkable weaver. And what's interesting is everyone would go, oh, that's wonderful. Just look at all those beautiful handicrafts that this Indian princess does and stuff. And of course, anybody who was Zuni would go, ah, ha, ha, weaving, that's a man's job, right? And so it's obvious that this, this person is two-spirited because men weave, women don't weave, right? And so this, this notion about, you know, th that the, the thing that they took as the most symbolic of her um, you know, femaleness was in fact what the Zunis, um, re you know, knew as the the um, an indicator of his maleness, right? So, you know, we think about gender as being something that's pretty pretty solid, but of course, uh, here this person was having a lot of fun back in the 1880s, messing up um, all those those uh, highfalutin folks in Washington D.C. So. Also, things like racialized status. We know, again, that these, as I've mentioned, um, the notion of race is something that's not particularly fixed, uh, and it's things that people may claim or, or not claim. But what I find quite interesting, for instance, is how and uh, what miraculous thing occurs when somebody comes from South, South America, for instance, and suddenly they go from being white to being Hispanic or Latino in the course of a 12-hour plane ride. Like, I don't f know how that happens, right? And it's often, you know, when you talk to people, you say, like, they s suddenly I'm presented with this thing and I have to, have to fill out a form and, cr and, and check the note that I'm Hispanic. How did that happen, right? Because, uh, you know, and, and again, not, there's a, a lot of diversity in, in South, Amer South America, a huge amount of diversity. But for some, somebody who has seen themselves as being a, you know, a Spani of Spanish descent, and only Spanish descent, which is questionable to begin with, um, to see themselves as suddenly becoming non-white within a, you know, a, a plane ride is pretty miraculous, but apparently something really happens up above. Now, I know that in my life I have been regarded as Eurasian, I've been um, you know, regarded as Punjabi, all kinds of things. Um, and, uh, and it's been very hard sometimes to shake people's uh, perception of you once they've found this label to fit you in. But again, place, status, all of these things figure, and it, uh, figure into um, these racialized categories and how people perceive you, right? Um, 
markers of religious affiliation, uh, markers of socioeconomic class, oops, which I managed to forget in, up there, uh, body size. And it's something we don't like to talk about in our society, but body size is a very big signifier. And this was the, in fact, the anecdote I was sharing this afternoon, is that, um, again, not that I spend a lot of time going for medical tests, but this just happened to be another medical test <laughs> anecdote. Um, I was having a medical test, and it was one where I was not, uh, I was again dressed in a hospital gown. I think it's the only two anecdotes I have, both times at hospital gowns. Interesting. Hmm. What is that about? Um, and uh, it, was, it was interesting because I didn't have my shoes. And um, what I've noticed is that when my shoes are, when I'm wearing shoes, even if I might be sort of stripped from my other clothes in other ways, that people will glimpse at your shoes and try to peg you based on your shoes. Anyway, just an observation, but an interesting master's thesis, PhD thesis, shoes as signifiers. But um, I was having this test done, and I noticed people were speaking to me really slowly, really slowly, and using sort of monosyllabic terms. And finally somebody said to me, do you work? And of course, as I said, <laughs> My first response was, I have a very sarcastic tongue. Did you figure that out yet? And of course, my first thought in my head was, no, I don't work. I sit at home in fluffy slippers and eat bonbons all day. Um, of course, that's only what I could aspire to, but apparently I don't do that. I just look like I do. And finally I said, no, I work. And she said, oh, where do you work? At the university. Do you like being a secretary? Uh, well, no, I've never been a secretary at the university. I'm actually a professor. Suddenly, the language changes. The speed changes. Suddenly, people are using, you know, polysyllabic words. It's very, very interesting, right? And what I realize, of course, quite is that because I am of larger stature, let's just say it fat, I am considered first um, uneducated. And again, there's an assumption that if you're uneducated, you're stupid. And which, of course, is not this not equivalent. Um, that I obviously don't work. Um, that I'm, uh, and that I, I, I couldn't possibly be educated, much less hold down a decent job, which apparently I have. And it was just really, really fascinating. But we don't, but those are very, very um, in, you know, those are assumptions that are made all the time in our society. And again, it might be different in other societies where if you are, you know, fatter, you're considered of higher status and because you've got more nutrition on you and stuff like that. I always want my Nigerian colleague always said, my mother would love you, you know, she just so love you. And I'm like, can she adopt me? <laughs> my mother would like you. So, you know, just stop eating so much. So, Anyways, but body size really does, is, is a big signifier. Disability, again, we make all kinds of presumptions about people who have physical disabilities uh, or different abilities. And of course, there are a whole variety of uh, you know, dis disabilities that we don't see, um, which people can or cannot, um, you know, are, are, may or may not be manifested. Um, sexual identity, culture is again, uh, socioeconomic class. These are, you know, people can look at your clothes. Uh, you know, does it look like you shop at a discount store or you're going to some, you know, higher class place? Um, geography, does you look like a rural person or an urban person? Uh, what else? Are there other markers, social markers that you can think of? The body or, or of behavior? One thing that it may not be as um, as important in Canada, but maybe to some degree, is is um, uh, language and dialect. Because it, when I talk when I talk to my friends in Britain, there are you know there's a huge amount of of uh, sort of diversity in, in pegging people be about their socioeconomic class based on their on their uh, style of language. 
and I've got a friend who was born and raised in like one of the you know really you know in Brixton in London but she went to a really she was super smart and she went to a posh school and she says I love messing with their minds because they hear her they hear her somebody hears her on the vo uh, voice and thinks that she's some upper class um, you know white British person and then they see her and she's in fact now a, you know I'm sure well educated uh, but obviously and uh, you know a black um, Britain and it's just not what they expect right and she's very obviously of you know Caribbean heritage and things like that and and uh, and she's got great dreads and everything but it's just with the accent they're like I, she doesn't get it so much here in Canada because we don't necessarily have those associations with um, the same you know dialects but it's very very common in Britain anyone else any other markers you can think of gestures gestures yes absolutely because they can have how, how much space you take up right mm -hmm. absolutely anyway so all of these things are ways in which we read bodies and we do them again as I said consciously unconsciously um, and sometimes we do it not necessarily to to be negative to someone but it's just the ways in which we know how to we think we know how to approach someone or assumptions we make right so what does this all mean then in terms of healthcare encounters? When bodies, when biomedicine, and when institutions really collide? So what does this all mean? Now, I want to go back to um, the context of, of uh, some of the healthcare, uh, organization of healthcare, and return to the context of counting and care, notably the dimension of time, because this really shapes a lot of the interactions between parents and caregivers, uh, patients and caregivers, sorry, as I mentioned. And, you know, I talked about how there was all this time compression and less time, but there's also another factor uh, a dimension that, of, of a time dimension that I want to mention, and that is that nurses are generally taught to treat everyone the same and to avoid conflict by treating everyone the same. And generally speaking, and again, um, nursing uh, education, like physician education, really seldom attends to structural inequities and the context of ill health. Um, like nursing, like biomedicine, nursing practice presumes as uniform, stable object of care, and uh, effectively as one, uh, as I think Jackson calls, whiting out class and ethnocultural differences. And so this notion that equal time expenditure with each patient is indicative of fairness of treatment is, uh, is something that we found quite common. But there's a difference between equality, treating everybody the same in equity, spending time with people who need to ensure, um, you know, to have more time, to ensure equivalent outcomes. And what was also really in interesting in terms of time is that racialized bodies were routinely seen as time consuming. So again, under this sort of regime of time and time management and patient, the you know patient care, racialized bodies are time consuming, and they're time consuming because um, they presume they're going to have linguistic barriers. They presume that um, there will be too many queries about practices that quote unquote everyone is supposed to know, and that there might be resistance to timetable procedures, time to take a shower, time to breastfeed, time to check out of the hospital. So additional time was not a commodity that nurses can afford to spend. And so um, it was, again, we have this notion that time is as vicious as a resource that could be allocated equally among patients under their care, but in fact, uh, at the same time, they're having to look and see, you know, uh, what can I do to kind of speed up and, and treat as many people as possible? So what I found was that in the kind of controlled frenzy of the uh, obstetric wards, nursing staff would take a very rapid perusal of the ward and by taking a read of the bodies under their surveillance, um, they would decide again that certain people uh, could be, should be kind of attended to first because they were less time consuming. And so this appraisal would involve reducing individuals, not surprisingly, to again these characteristics of, of racialized status. Uh, and people would be, you know, the, all racialized persons would be essentially homogenized under a single kind of category. And so there was this kind of 
focusing on phenotypic characteristics, um, and there was there would be this presumption that if they saw quote unquote a Chinese face, that that woman will not want to take a shower or wash her hair. So I don't need to ask her, and I don't want to you know so rush past her. Or South Asian women, those South Asian women, they will not breastfeed philostrum, and so and besides, they're like quote unquote little princesses who refuse to walk after delivery. So I'm not even going to go near them. And as one um, very forthcoming um, nurse said to me, um, the nurses won't go into an East Indian woman's rooms because they go, oh, they're just going to do whatever they want to do anyway, so just leave them alone. They're just going to do what they want. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not even going to bother. You know, and what's interesting, of course, is that when things like language problems can occur, um, what was often happen is, is that they would see somebody and they just presume that they don't speak English and then be surprised when they actually did talk to them and they, in fact they were fluent in English. On the other hand, it was frustrating sometimes because, um, you know, y many of you, how many of here people speak a second or third or fourth language, right? Right. How many of you know the word for catheter in many of the languages that you work in, right? You know, so let's say you've just undergone, you know, 24 hours, of you know, 20 hours of labor, you're exhausted, you speak fluent English, but suddenly you can't remember the name for this thing that is hurting you, right? Um, because, I don't know about you, but maybe when I was studying Chinese that was not in a lot of the lexicon that I learned. Um, and yet, you know, you'd have a, a, a remember the story of this, this, um, Vietnamese woman who was talking about how um, she had a, her, they'd given her a catheter and it was really really painful and she was trying to talk to the nurse to get them to um, take the catheter out and she was sleeping with her baby and she was very happy to be you know lying with her baby and stuff like that and she kept calling and was trying to explain the whatever and they finally went she wants something away she wants something oh so they take the baby away and so she's left with the one comfort for her, but the catheter is still there, right? And she's still in pain. So, you know, there's, it, there are, are this kind of presumption that, oh, she's Vietnamese, she doesn't want to sleep with the baby. Um, and uh, it was, again, uh, without, because things are, stays in, in hospital are so brief, uh, even if they have an interpreter service, they might not be available overnight. Um, and so it becomes harder and harder for people to find ways of communicating. So people have gone from being visible, however, to being, of course, invisible. So a lot of times the new mothers would tell us, you know, time, I would be sitting there and I'm watching and time is spent disproportionately with the white bodies, the unmarked bodies in other beds. So they would, you know, be asking for something and constantly nurses are rushing past, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 whatever, some other time, what have you, right? And so they began to sense that, of course, that they were invisible themselves. And again, what's interesting is that the nurses themselves, you know, affirmed this. They said, you're right, like, we just judge that we don't have time to, um, to see these people who we think are going to be problematic, they're going to be time consuming, it's a resource, it's all sort of commodified, and so we are going to leave them. As um, Melissa, who had had a, uh, a, um, a, a very bad postpartum infection, and she was trying to tell them about the infection, get them to examine her, but also wanted a few painkillers. And she said, you know, I keep asking about it, and they kept running past me. And she said, you know, Denise, I think the nurses think that Vietnamese people are mean. And that was what she took back with her from her experience in hospital, that they think we're mean. It wasn't until a home care nurse came several days later and found her crawling on all fours because she was in so much pain she couldn't be bipedal, that someone actually went, oh, you have a very severe postpartum infection, right? But that was her take home, was that women, that they think, the nurses think we're mean. Mariah, who was a, a, a young Cree woman said, for instance, there was a white lady um, in, in there and she got everything, everything she asked for she'd get, they'd get her and you know she was treated so well with me or say any other native lady it was like you know ah oh, you asked for something yeah 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 in a minute right so what does this all mean it's not surprising that these observations and interactions were read in the context of everyday racism and 
the historical relationships that have existed uh, between and amongst uh, whatever racialized group they are a uh, person might identify with and the um, uh, healthcare personnel. So certainly personal racism is reflected in the population at large and, and it's represented in healthcare and I will add mm -hmm. that it's represented not just amongst staff but also amongst patients towards staff. And you know we don't have time to, t to cover that today but that is another dimension as well of this. Um, but in addition to those forms of racism we have to also recognize that there is pretty significant institutional racism uh, and that is the you know regarded as the collective failure of an organization or social structure to provide an ad appropriate and professional service to people because of their color or culture or ethnic origin and it can be seen as at or detected in processes, attitudes, and behavior that amount to discrimination among uh, unwitting prejudice, ignorance, thoughtlessness, and racist stereotyping which disadvantages people in ethnic minority groups, and that's McPherson. Or as Jones very succinctly says, <laughs> institutionalized racism is evident as inaction in the face of need. And certainly, I think we can agree that the perceived inaction of nursing staff is interpreted through the kind of lived experiences uh, of discrimination faced by racialized women um, and again the historical uh, relationships of, of racism that uh, uh, are embedded in our immigration policies and integration policies really circumscribe and inform the interpersonal and institutional relationships. In addition, Structural racism, or kind of creating and maintaining spaces that are, you know, Euro Canadian or red as white values, the ones that are seen as quote unquote common sense, um, also uh, is also pertinent here. And I think they tend to um, exclude uh, people in a, in a very pernicious way, but again, in a, in a more subtle way. So let me see if I can try to bring together some of the uh, streams of thought that I've been raising here. First off, the legacy of sight in biomedicine and the reductionist medical gaze, the visualing technol visualizing technologies that have eliminated the embodied personhood and which further mystify the representation of the object and reinforced by neoliberal rationalizations of time and the surveillance of staff. All of this contributes to the superficial reading of racialized bodies in healthcare encounters and inevitably I would suggest to various forms of racism. So how can bodies be more visible and how can that visibility be sus more sustained? In essence, what would an embodied care look like for both healthcare practitioners and racialized, minoritized patients? I think actually I'm going to um, move on here a little bit. And, you know, in part, I think there has to be a recognition that all of us are socially constructed. Uh, persons and that we have to grapple with the fact that we all are um, have a are embedded in a, a social landscape that uh, situates us within uh, a certain gendered and social hierarchy and that is produced from a uh, intersection of social markers that there is heterogeneity in all forms of difference and there are you know have been many attempts to create a more sort of culturally sensitive healthcare system but often um, the end up being a kind of cookbook style and what's really funny um, for if any of you find uh, your particular ethnic or religious or whatever identity in one of those um, handbooks on cultural you know uh, competence it's really funny to read them because you realize what do you mean I'm not supposed to whatever right because most of us again we're none of us are cookie cutter copies of anything, right? We all adapt um, to, uh, to different uh, ideas and situations and I don't know very many people who believe exactly what their parents told them, right? Um, or, or behave exactly like our mothers expected us to behave, right? Or fathers. So all of us are, you know, take in different explanations of things, different understandings of things. So, and yet these cookbooks tend to, again, homogenize everyone. So it is certainly important to ask people, to examine how do people understand a particular context 
context, a particular disease? How do they understand what's going on around them? And again, we need to also be challenging assumptions around, you know, ability for, for self-care. Um, do people have time to take off? You know, maybe they're working multiple jobs, those kinds of things. That might make it very, very difficult for people to engage in the kind of recommended healthcare practices that is often assumed everyone can do. Um, Anna Lee said, um, and she was talking about her own experience, she said, you know, like, take every delivery and every birth and every woman and every child as individual. I'm a different person. This is different child. It's a different labor. Explain every single time and be more patient. They've said it a thousand times, but I'm learning the first time. So teach me like it was the first time. And um, so uh, certainly the idea about you know, beca being more sensitive to an individual and being more understanding of an individual is extremely important. Um, my, unfortunately you can't see Dr. Sylvia Reitmanova's name up there, but um, a wonderful postdoctoral um, uh, postdoc that I worked with until just uh, last month. Dr. Sylvia Reitmanova has been working on what uh, she calls diversity inclusive health care. And she's done a really interesting study in Ottawa looking at um, all forms of diversity. So uh, person, women with disabilities or persons with, it was focused on maternity care, but also transsexuals with, um, and their experiences in um, uh, maternity care uh, and uh, transgendered people. So, and, and uh, she was, what she found was, you know, she suggests that we need to engage in both individual institutional change, so for institutions to um, identify barriers to inclusion, to, uh, to consult regularly with uh, minority communities, and again, to broaden what we think of as minority communities, um, to have, engage in a collective reflection on dominant culture and class values, to enhance diversity of staff, to in, ensure that the visual environment reflects diversity because you know if you go into any kind of healthcare or hospital setting there are all kinds of pictures and stuff all around you but um, it might not reflect the diversity of the patient population. She also talks about the importance of individual change, of critical self-reflection, of asking questions, of encouraging people to express their needs. And certainly all of these things are extremely important. But. I think while creating diversity inclusive care is important and while you know promoting individual care and uh, you know being able to tease out people's individual understandings are also important that we really need to think about ways of ways that we can refashion the lens of biomedicine to encourage the consideration of disease within multiple layers of flesh blood and bone community and nature, history and society. In essence, we need to find a way of rematerializing re uh, migrant bodies, racialized bodies, everybody in many ways, uh, in order to create, I think, a more just health uh, healthcare system, but also for our diverse society to create an effective one as well. So I will end you with there. Thank you.